Uh, welcome to week four of Explore Classroom Special Edition PhotoCamp Live. Uh, for those who are new, my name is Andrew Brennan. I am an education fellow here at National Geographic and your host every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern as we learn from some of the best photographers in the world. Um, we will explore how photography is a powerful tool to understand the world around us, as well as our own personal journeys. And we'll learn how images can cultivate empathy, understanding, and connection with others, and in doing so, help to overcome adversity and injustice. I share this quote every week, but it's my favorite, so I do it again now. It was historian Studs Terkel who said, the act of telling one story is an act that enlarges democracy. So here's how to work. Each week, I'll be joined by two National Geographic photographers who work in different corners of the planet to hear about their work, as well as the trade secrets that they've learned along the way. You will have a chance to ask your questions directly with these photographers, so come prepared. Um, and the best part, the really fun part, each week we will announce a photo assignment that you can take part in. You can submit up to three photos taken during your assignment for one of our National Geographic photographers to review and potentially have your work featured on ne next week's broadcast and on one of National Geographic's Instagram channels. You can find the link to the submission form in the chat, in the YouTube description, or at natgeoed.org slash exploreclassroom. We want to hear your stories and experiences. Join us on Instagram using the hashtag PhotocampLive or the hashtag GenGeo on Twitter and Instagram. At the end of the day's broadcast, we'll share some of the photos that you submitted during last week's event. If you remember, last week we were joined by David Gutenfelder and Rosa Morton. They discussed their drive to document the important stories of our time, including the COVID-19 pandemic. They also highlighted some of the ways that photography contributes to the global conversation, provides a sense of meaning to shared human experiences, and helps to shape humanity's collective consciousness. Um, if you remember, Rosen shared some really intimate portraits of her experience as a nurse um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this week, I'm excited to say we are joined by National Geographic photographers Evgenia Abugeva, as well as Jorge uh, Penjuaga, excuse me, Jorge Pentuaga. Um, they will discuss the ways they use photography to express emotions and abstract concepts. Evgenia and Jorge's work often focuses on memory and draws inspiration from dreams, books, paintings, and films. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce Evgenia and Jorge, and I apologize, Jorge, for uh, mispronouncing your name there. It's okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you for introduction. Thank you, um, yeah, my name is Evgenia. Um, I'm a photographer from originally from Russia, from Russia North, uh, and I'm a contributing photographer to National Geographic magazine. Hi everyone, I, I am Jorge Panchoaga. I am from Colombia. I am photographer and anthropologist, and my work is about the relationship, uh, the human culture and the nature. This is my focus of my work and I am explorer for the National Geographic Society. We lost to Andrew. Uh, Evgen, uh, I, I know that you are uh, presenting uh, first. Do you want to go ahead and queue up your presentation? Uh, yes, yes. Today we're going to talk about, talk about dreams and how we can reimagine our world around us. I think, well, we all see the world differently because we're all different and we kind of live in the parallel realities every, every day. And our realities consist of books we read, uh, visuals we see, um, stories we hear and stories we experience. And um, I'm just gonna show you some of the work that I did um, throughout the years 
and inspiration and visual references that guided me through my creative process. Um, I'll start with the, the first story I did as a serious uh, photographic project was from my hometown. It was 10 years ago now. And um, on this um, slide, you'll see this is the illustration covers of the illustrated um, children books that I was uh, reading when I was a kid. And I love them because I could relate to each and every person, <laughs> kid in this books, especially in the snowy landscape. And I love to look at each illustration and make up my own stories. As I said, I grew up in the Russian Arctic. And uh, when I became a photographer, I came back to my hometown and I wanted to photograph it as I remember it. So I wanted to revisit my dreams as a kid, but also my memories. And I met this girl, Tanya, and the images, the project became this playful um, project. And we collaborated with Tanya on creating those images. And in the middle of the project, I realized that um, I'm, I'm leaning, leaning towards this aesthetic that reminds me a lot of um, Russian um, children's books meaning that the composition was quite central and very simple, but at the same time, I wanted every photograph to tell, uh, to have its own story and people who look at the photograph can make up their own story when they see it. And also in terms of colors, it's very much very bright, uh, whimsical. Um, and I think it was, you know, informed a lot by animation and, um, and books. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was printing my work from the project I shot um, a year ago. And all of a sudden, this vision of this animation film came to me, and I rewatched it with great pleasure. And this animation is from 1957. It's called Snow Queen um, of uh, Hans Christian Andersen. And it's a story about Snow Queen who lives in this. Um, um, Crystal Palace. Uh, this is some still uh, stills from this animation. And this is really this beautiful um, um, drawings and the, uh, the Snow Queen is very cruel and she has no feelings. And she kidnapped this little boy Kai and she turned his heart into um, an icicle. And I remember when I was watching this uh, cartoon years and years ago, this Snow Queen gave me chills. It, she was so scary. And the reason I remember this um, animation is because as I was printing this exact image, actually, um, I realized what this place reminded me of. This is the place I photographed um, a year ago. It's called Dixon. It's a town on the shore of Arctic Ocean. It was a very busy, vibrant town, and now it's um, completely empty and abandoned. And when I was there, I, um, I was lucky to have this beautiful Aurora Borealis, the Northern Light, that colored everything in this surreal neon colors. So I was wandering in this town, uh, collecting images, and I felt kind of, it, it, it was so strange. I felt like I, I entered this par parallel reality and um, it was so surreal. And now I kind of understand that maybe somewhere deep, <laughs> deep inside unconsciously, um, I was maybe imagining that I was in the, on the edge of the world in the kingdom of, of the Snow Queen. Um, and this is the painting of William Blake. I saw it in this um, exhibition here in London um, a year ago. And this particular painting caught my attention. Um, although it's very small, it's just eight by 10 um, inches. And it's called the ghost of a flea. So it's a, this, this vision came to Blake um, in his dream and, and in his sleep. And it's a mix of flea, the insect and the human. And it's very mysterious, this fantastical um, image, very eerie, but I, um, I really liked it and I liked it so much that I bought a postcard and I kept it in my diary and I was looking quite 
a lot at it. And then um, a couple of months later, I went to photograph the uh, one of the biggest walrus gathering on the planet, also in the Russian Arctic. And um, I was staying in this hut. And one day there were thousands and thousands of walruses surrounding our hut. And this was a view from our door. And as I was photographing walruses, and especially in this light, um, there was, it was quite foggy uh, in this golden light. The, when walrus, me and walrus made this eye contact, all of a sudden this vision of um, Blake's ghost of a flea came to me. Um, not so much because of course it has absolutely nothing in common, but in a way in this moment, the walrus became this very um, mysterious creature, which they are. I mean, we don't know many things about them. They're, they're, they're having the life of their own, the mysterious life. And um, I, I just thought that it was funny how these two images somehow connected in my head. Um, then um, also last year, I was um, honored to be asked to photograph Greta Thunberg. Um, I photographed her for Time magazine. And when the editor called me, um, I just closed my eyes and I tried to imagine how the image of her will be and how I want to photograph her. But also just to think, what does she represent to me and to other people? And at that time and still now, I mean, the first things that came to my mind were these images of um, Nordic women warriors. Some also images from the animation from, from girls Viking warriors. Then of course, Joan of Arc. And I also knew that I'll be photographing her on the shore of the sea because uh, she was arriving to Lisbon um, after her voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. And at that time of the year, I knew that there will be a very beautiful blues and, and, and pink colors um, at sunset. And so I imagined this kind of the palette of from Monet paintings and the, the beautiful hair of Venice in, uh, from Botticelli. But I also thought about the tarot cards, actually the archetype of um, Queen of Cups who represents the intuition, but also this very strong um, and heightened sensitivity. And that's what I felt what Greta was because she has very strong outward gaze, but also she has very strong internal intuitive um, gaze. So I wanted to capture that. So I created this little mood board and, and then this is the image that came out of it. Um, in the close up, and then it became a cover of a person of the year. So that was a really wonderful experience. Um, I suppose I'm showing this to you because all of us um, are treasure troves of all those memories and references that we collect over the years. And um, I just would like to encourage you if you decide to make this assignment. Um, to open that treasure trove and take out all the things um, that you have there and just feel free to use them. Thank you. This is my presentation. And I know that Jorge likes to travel in his imaginary worlds as well. <laughs> it's amazing, Eugenia, how you explore the reference for our kings of souls and transform everything up in the, this great sun. Unbelievable image. I am a very fan of your image and your work. It's really amazing. And I, I love it to see and try to understand how is all your process because of course it's, it's half a, a memories and, and pictures, anime, uh, history of the arts and, and I like it too much. It's amazing. Thank um, you. Well, tell yeah. your stories now. Okay. Yeah. For now, I'm share the screen. Okay. Read me a minute.
Okay. I tell a story today for everyone. Uh, let me let me I I put in order because now I have yeah that's is the beginning. Okay, I was born in the Cauca, in South Colombia. My family is part of the NASA indigenous community that lives deep in the mountains of the central Andes. Oral memory tells us that we, the NASA, were never conquered with weapons by the Spanish on their search for riches. It was with religion that they managed to the enter our territories and so our lives. The indigenous Colombia communities of this area of Colombia have fought political for the centuries to maintain autonomy in their territories. And in this way, be able to resist the pressure of change that drive the policies and economies of the contemporary world. In 2006, when I started visiting the indigenous communities, people told me the guerrillas were behind those mountains, pointing somewhere in the distance. I tried trying to go those words. I dedicate myself to visiting these mountains where the NASA people live. NASA indigenous life is centered on agriculture, the coast, the fields, and the traditions visiting the certain places and taking long walks to go study, visit a friend or a family member. But it wasn't always like this. In the early 20th century, many of these communities lost their, their land. They were tricked by landowners in the cities. The indigenous people who didn't know how to read signal titles of sales. This drove many indigenous families from their territories. The few families that remained were forced to work as terrajeros, sharecroppers. The terraje system consisted of working six days of a week for free for the new owner as a payment for living on the land. On Sunday, they could plant and farm for their families. I heard the story of how they lad of, of how they had lost the land by listening to the elders, the grandparents. I not only read research, I spoke to the community and I learned how they took their mountains back. On one occasion, talking to Jesus Yalanda, he told me. I will go out in the middle of the night and walk deep into the forest in the dark without a flashlight because the owner had people watching, birds, who he paid. At that time, they called the paramilitaries birds. It was dangerous to be caught walking in the mountains, making, plas making plans to get our land back. Sometimes we went out with other people. There weren't many of us and we didn't all know each other. But we were bored of working for free without having anything for ourselves, nothing for our children, working for him on our land. When I heard this history, I imagined Jesus and the other people walking in the dark. Imagine them planning to take back their land in the middle of the night. Jesus told me these stories by the fire as we ate dinner. We were with the little children. He also told us the name of the rivers, stories of goblins and ghosts and animals and plants. In the 1970s, these communities recovered their land and by 2011, when I started my second project, I have visited the mountains for more than five years. First, as a, as a student of anthropology, then as an amateur photographer. 
when I wanted to talk about all these invisible connections, I realized it was not enough to photograph what was happening in everyday life. Everyday life. I began to take elements from the history of photography using what others had done before to talk about the issues that interest me. I also use the image that camera that came to mind when I listened to the stories that the indigenous elders had told me. I drew some of these things as a sketch of ideas. Soon, I went in search of this image. I remember the stories my, of my mother told me about my grandfather, Rosendo, whom I never know, but who was born in Lame, an indigenous reservation in Cauca Mountains. And he passed down us to many traditional practices and beliefs. All these things continue to fit that universe of meaning. Working with the indigenous families, I understand the meaning of home for the Nasa people. <clears throat> For them, home is much more than a roof, walls, and objects. They call it La Casa Grande, and it is made up of the whole territory and everything that lives in it. The mountains are part of the house. The trees are part of the house. The rivers, the foxes, and the birds are part of the house. The goblin, the ghosts, and the mountain springs are all part of the house. The idea of La Casa Grande permitted me to be understand that to be an indigenous person is to have a territory that marks our difference, to be able to imagine our own future. And I'd like to better explain this. The experience of living in the mountains and listening to their stories allowed me to better understand the indigenous world. I used those histories and my imagination combined with my knowledge to make photographs. I used the principle of the camera oscura to bring the mountains around in the house into the rooms and talk about how the trees, the animals are all part of the know as home. I photographed the places where this story are shared, like the kitchen. I point out that learning our culture is learning to defend it. It's a way to fight for it. I look at the lanes drawn by geography to represent the mountains, the contours. We drew them on the paper on which the image were projected using the camera obscura. That's how I fused them into the portraits of my indigenous friends to point out that identity and territory are inseparable. I made the night, which appeared in the story of Jesus, the general setting for my project. I thought without the anonymous darkness of the night, they would not have their homes, their territory. Years later, when I first published work in a national geographic space, I was working in the Magdalena River Delta. I had been working for several years with a community of fishermen who built their village on the water of a marsh. I wanted to photograph their life and learn about their relationship with water. In turn, I asked myself if our auctions are recorded in nature. Can the land, nature, and landscape hold information about our activities throughout our history? Human ecology and microbiology have been approaching this in the interpretation for years. But can water remember? I asked myself. I found out that our researchers use something called ice cores by drilling into a glacier or an ice sheet accumulated over thousands of years. You get information about the climate of the past. They do this by reading the, chemi the chemical composition of the air, volcanic eruptions, and the other factors that affect the climate. 
They are like frozen time capsules. I wasn't able to do experiments like this on a nervous glazers. Would I begin imagine what if in the future someone could see in those water molecules the life in the village? It's canoes, the fishing gear, the acts of violence, all frozen in the memory of water. The metaphor of our encounter with the earth trigger this image that brings us closer to the scientific knowledge and the local people's lives through the use imagination. And that's it. The photography, it, it seemed about photography. I think the photography, it's about life. Okay. Hello. And that's it. Thanks, Jorge, for, for taking us through that and, and you as well, Genia. Um, Jorge, we're going to get to questions in just a second for everyone, but before we do, um, would you mind going ahead and, and walking us through the assignment for this week? Oh, Jorge, you're muted. Jorge, we can't hear you still. You're, you're on mute. No. You listen to me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. I share my screen, if it's good, to this, to present the assignment, yeah. So the assignment for this week is to interview someone in your family who has always attracted your attention. If it's not someone in your family, it could be someone you know, always using the necessary security protocols to be safe. You can even talk to them via Zoom. Try to imagine their stories. Try to put yourself in their shoes. When they tell your their stories, the most fantastic stories are stored in the memory of adults, your grandmothers and grandfathers and older people. Talk to them to understand how they imagine their worlds from their times, from their, from their realities. And with these words and the tools you have seen today, try to make stories with three images. If you don't have an opportunity to talk to someone, feel free to make image about your own history. It can be real or completely fantastical. And please use all these elements Eugenia shared with us today, uh, the different the different uh, aspect to to um, fit your imagination with uh, draws and art and paintings and anime and all these things uh, can be fantastic the, the the assignments okay and please uh, if 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 you like Share your image and experience on Instagram using Photocam, hashtag Photocam Live and hashtag Gene Geo. If you are interested in having your work reviewed by myself and Eugenia to be considered for a future in next week's session, please come back to this YouTube video and find the image submission for form in the video description. The submission from is also available through the Explorer Classroom page on Nat Geo. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jorge, for walking us through that. I, um, and, you know, both of your presentations were really so, so beautiful. Um, again, the way that you uh, portray uh, power, uh, your portrait of, of Greta, and, and, and even in just your, your approach to photography as a whole is really, really fascinating. And 
and Jorge, um, I thought your last line was uh, was right on the money, especially considering this week's um, uh, assignment uh, that photography is not about photography, but about life. And really, uh, that's what we are asking folks to capture with this week's assignment, uh, to capture examples of life. Um, so uh, I have so many questions that I could ask, but I want to give uh, some of our viewing audience the opportunity as well. Um, so uh, if you have questions and you're watching on YouTube live, please drop them in the chat and we will get to them. But first, uh, we have two young people who have joined us um, on camera today and I want to give them the opportunity to uh, go ahead and ask a question as well. So John Marcus, if you could um, go ahead and turn on your cameras. Uh, and John, we will start with you if you have a question. Yeah, hey. Um, so first off, both your photos are really, like, to you, your photos are really amazing. And I really like the way that you edit them or, like, take them in it. It almost makes it look like a, a painting. And I'm, I'm curious as to how you get that look to your photos. It really adds to the, to the story, I think. And... Yeah, I can answer to that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, editing is a very big part of um, any photo project. And as in, in, the, in the story that I showed with Abandoned Town, the ghost town where everything is so green, um, I stayed there actually for three weeks, but I shot everything in just um, less than four hours because the only time when I, I thought the light was great was when the Northern Lights appeared and it lasted only for four hours. So that's when I photographed everything. And so the, there is this light consistency throughout the, the story. So that's important. And I think that's, you know, you're right. Um, to, to be able to create this atmosphere and the mood, color um, and light uh, plays a big role. And, and sometimes I work on the story for many, many months. And in the end, I edit it to just 10 images, but then they're, they're um, you know, strong because they're similar in atmosphere. Jorge, did you have anything to add to that? Well, for me, this experience to create this this project is it's very uh, it's like a story of my family because I grow up every time with these different histories and uh, of course I try to to put the these these stories in in my image and and I try to work in the night uh, in in the high mountains it's very cold and. And it's strange because because the the these areas is uh, very conflict areas. We have a uh, war, like uh, I don't know, um, for centuries. So yeah, make these projects and make these pictures. It's it's a uh, 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 very very hard in different moments, but yeah, for me it's a nice experience. Thank you, Jorge, um, and uh, thank you, John, for your question. Um, Marcus, do you want to go ahead and ask a question as well? Hi, yeah. Thank you so much, guys, for your all your work. I think it's so inspirational to hear you talk about dreams and how you create, recreate your your own image into into photos and then with light. Um, I wanted to ask a, a, a general question. Um, more like what advice could you give like young photographers just starting to create that um, image of, of their reality through light? Um, how do you, how, what is the process of, of creating that project? And maybe the technical aspects of creating that light because sometimes it's really difficult to, to maybe take pictures in very dark environments and, and maybe an equipment would, would make that better um but yeah it's it's such great work for both of you so thank you 
Thanks, Marcus. Um, yeah, in terms of low light, it's tricky. Um, I mean, you need to use tripod um, if you want to photograph, you know, stars. And I, I always like to photograph, you know, starry skies and, and, and etc. And for the northern lights, you need to have, you know, long exposures. So yeah, if you want to photograph at night, you need to um, learn long exposure. So you need tripod, you need um, camera, um, you know, and it doesn't necessarily need to be some fancy professional camera, but just something that can, you know, stay on the tripod. If you don't have tripod, sometimes I, you know, when I walk for too long, I, and, and, and I don't want to carry a tripod with me or I forget, I just create a tripod from a log or something. Um, and you just put your camera and, and use long exposure. But then um, to create the, the light, I mean, I use only natural light, but when, when you work on the story, um, maybe the way I work is I choose three images that attract my attention. So they're like kind of a core beat to the, to, to the, um, to the story. And then if these three have consistent light or color, then I'd kind of add another beads to the story, but then I'll, I'll, I'll use this core to kind of carry on and develop the rest of it. You know what I mean? So, so I, I, that's important for me to, to arrive to the point when there is at least three images that I like and then I can build from it. Okay, and my advice to do that is, uh, Every flashlight is, is nice. Uh, the cell phones, the old cell phones, in this, the people of these mountains have the 1100 Nokia uh, cell phone. It's a, I don't know, it's the most resistant cell phone in the history. And I, I, I take uh, many pictures with these cell phones. The, uh, the people give me the cell phone and I try to uh, illuminate the homes, yeah, the trees, yeah. And in, in, in another moment, I, I catch my, my, my different lights of my home and I, I put in the back and I go with these things and I use it in, in, the, in the spaces. And if you have the, the digital camera, it's very easy to try and try and try. Because if you work in film, uh, you have a lot of troubles because, because film is more difficult, is more specific knowledge, yeah, it's more expensive. So if you don't have practice, it's better if you go to the through the night with the digital camera first and try to have different practice and after that you have your film camera and and, and work with them because yeah maybe maybe the the first two weeks is difficult but after that uh, you you can have a very awesome results so trial and error and embrace some of the uh, some of the technology at your disposal. Um, thank you, Marcus, for for your question. We're now going to move on to a couple of questions that came in via the YouTube chat. Um, we have people tuning in from all over the world today, which is really exciting, um, and some great questions that have already come through. So just to kick it off, one for you again, yeah. Um, D. Smith asks. Can you speak um, a little bit more about uh, writing in your journals and the storyboards that you shared? Um, what, what, do they, what role do they play in your process? And then for you, Jorge, from the same person, can you tell us a little bit of why you choose black and white um, as a way to display your photography and imagery? Uh, but Evgenia, starting with you, maybe. Uh, yeah, journaling um, is a big uh, part of my process, especially when I'm on the road and when I'm in the field working on something, but also when I'm not in the field, when I'm just kind of daydreaming, I'm, I'm, I always make sure that I have something to write. Um, 
and collect and tear things from different places and put it on the walls, etc. cetera. Um, for each project I have, you know, like many creative people and a lot of those, you know, people in, especially in cinema use a lot of uh, references and collect um, inspiration. So I have folders of um, inspiration images um, for different projects I work on. And it could be something very random, really. Sometimes just the sound, the music, that, um, that the tone of the music that I would like to, you know, uh, make it into visuals or make it visual, which is sometimes tricky. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a process. It's like uh, in, inseparable from taking pictures. Taking picture is literally, you know, it's, it's so quick. It, it's the preparation that um, not only physical preparation and traveling, but mental preparation and just thinking about it. That's what I think is the most important um, part of any project for me. It's a really important reminder uh, and a good insight into your process, Athenia. Uh, Jorge, um, why black and white? Okay, yeah. In my project about the fisher, fisher population in the Delta of Magdalena, I use uh, black and white film. So I, I work this project in, in film and I try to to develop this uh, film. It's a medium format film with water of different rivers of Colombia. I prepare the chemicals to develop these films uh, with water of the Rio Cauca, Rio Amazonas, and the river of Magdalena. And with different waters, I try to see if the water change the memory of the film. And that is my, my principal reason because in color do that is very difficult. So, so it's like impossible. It's not impossible, but it's like impossible way. So I, I use the, the black and white film. Uh, that is the reason. Jorge, I love how you have all these different techniques to kind of combine the person that you're photographing or the place with the literal territory or land or just natural features that um, that they're in. And, and that nugget around using the, the water from the different rivers, that's really interesting. Um, Matt, uh, uh, Matt uh, has another question for Afghania. Um, and, you know, he's, I think his question really hits on one of mine as well, which is that, you know, you really grew up in an area that looks like a fairy tale uh, from the, the surrounding uh, uh, kind of, um, from the surrounding area to the, even the animals that live there. Um, it's foreign to a lot of us, but, you know, do you have any suggestions for how we might harness that fairy tale energy um, in a metropolitan city such as London, for example. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I, I was lucky to be born in a very uh, interesting place, but I think every place is interesting, really. And and cities, for example, can be very surreal. And you know, there are so many uh, in places in London or other cities and so many different light, um, so many colors and so many different characters living here. So you, you, you can, you know, it's, it's all about how you look at things. I mean, yes, I, I photograph Arctic in this magical way, I suppose. I mean, I'm hoping that I'm, it's not only pretty pictures. I, 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 I do try to photograph the, you know, the reality of things in a sense that tell the stories of places um, that I visit. Um, but yes, aesthetically, I really love um, adding some magic. Um, but I think, you know, when, when somebody arrives to my region who has different sets of references or different state of mind, they will see absolutely different picture. It's, it's um, 
we all wear different glasses, right? So it depends on what kind of um, colored glasses you put on that day and you go out and see your city, your, your, your hometown, your village. Um, I think it's, it's, you don't need to live in this exotic, faraway place. Yeah, and, I, and, it's, a, and it's a powerful challenge, especially in this moment when people are uh, more kind of tied at home because of, of the coronavirus. How can you find those magical places um, that, that maybe you haven't noticed before? Um, Jorge, a question for you. You know, your photography really captures the tension um, between communities uh, who are living off of the earth and, um, and kind of the pressures of modernization and colonization and, and just how they are affecting these communities. So as you spent time with some of these communities and as you've gained their trust, um, what's, what's something that you've learned uh, that you think uh, everyone else should know about the way these folks live? Oh, it's a bigger question because uh, I learned a lot of things in these years. Because my my projects is is a long term project. I the dulce salada. It's a salt or fresh water. I work. I don't know, ten years maybe. Uh, so in that time, I I I learn a lot of things about the the knowledge of the community. Yeah. Uh, I think in, in the Cauca project, for example, I, I understand how many things of my, of my history, my familiar history, and the resistance in the far, far uh, time ago, because the indigenous people fight and fought um, for centuries, um, 500 años que llevan peleando. See? Um, sorry for saying that in Spanish, but it's important to say it in Spanish because, yeah, we have five centuries fought to, to have uh, a space and to have cultures and, and to make uh, our future. So, so yeah, it's, it's very difficult to me explain everything to I learn in English because many things is very specific things in the everyday life, in the how the people understand the water. All peoples in Colombia have a connection with the water. So for example, in the Andes uh, cultures, the people say they born or they become to the water. Yeah, they, they are a son of water, many of these cultures. In the Delta of the Magdalena, the people literally uh, born uh, encima del agua, up of the water, because the, the, the houses is built uh, on top of water. Every day is, is uh, they have the relationship with the water. And for me, that is very important because the water we have in the cities have a connection with this small uh, towns, yeah, with these small cultures, everyone has a connections. The the different cities in the in the Col in Colombia have connections with the the most far away uh, town, and for me, understand this through the photography is very very uh, important because it's the reason to to go out every day and try to understand another things and another ways to understand the world. Because when I understand the other ways to work, I, I, I can be a better person and I can be uh, understand uh, everyone have different visions of the future, different visions of what is uh, the right way, uh, what is the dreams. <laughs> So for me, that is the, the important things. Thank, and I know it's so hard to capture everything, um, but I appreciate you sharing uh, that, that bit of it. Um, so we're gonna 
move into the next section now where we're going to uh, review some of the photos that you all submitted from last week. Um, but before Afghania takes us through that, I just want to reiterate the assignment for this week, uh, which is to interview someone in your family who has always attracted your attention. Um, it can be a family member or maybe even just someone that you know and you're close to. Um, but try to imagine their stories and, and try to put yourself in their shoes. And, and you know, um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what some of you all come up with. Um, and so please be sure to submit it via the, the link in the YouTube chat. But Evgenia, do you want to take us through uh, some of the uh, photos that were submitted last week? Sure, yeah. So um, this is the images on the theme Making It Personal from last week. Uh, reviewed by David and Rosen. And the first image is by Ernesto Herrera Pellegrino. Um, and the caption says, when I was a child, I felt, when I, and I felt sad, grandma used to make me smile. Now I want to make her smile. I think he's tickling her. And the reviews, um, the review notes is, um, it shows the stronger relationship and bond while highlighting connection and aging it's a beautiful moment and a great example how to how a photograph can be a memory for a photographer and and other people who are looking at it. Um, the next image is submitted by Akash Van, uh, Vardan. And he says, I really want to tell my sister I love her a lot. Um, and David and Rosen commented that interestingly, this image of a young sister is a self-portrait of a photographer too. This is another example of a beautiful moment capturing a strong relationship and bond. The body language shows a vulnerability that is highlight, highlighted with a touch and connection. It makes us think about what and who we love the most. This is from Colin Gilpin. Um, and the caption says, I met Eric, Vanessa and Cameron, guests of Candlewood Suits Hotel in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, feeling the impact of gym closures from COVID pandemic, uh, they have chosen to work out on the parking lot as a way for the family to continue staying in shape. And this is an, this is an image of exercising outside is a exa good example of universal activities people are doing during the time of um, COVID. It, it is um, one of the new normals that we can all relate to. This one is um, from Gloria Vier Marie Morales Ayala. And I would like to read her caption, which is very um, powerful and strong. Um, she says, mental health has always been an issue for me. It's a topic that was difficult to approach. From time to time, I have different impulsive thoughts that make me absent when I'm in the company. Part of my hobby seems to be to think too much about the past, present, and future. Sometimes those futuristic so thoughts seem to be real, and they give me the feeling that I'm, I was losing air, grasping for air and normality. But this was my norm. I had the feeling I was literally going crazy. But as in this picture, there is always light around us when we need it. I go back to the deep breath and make sure I know those thoughts aren't real. They're just part of my imagination. Having mental health issues doesn't mean someone is crazy. We only need a little bit of help to comprehend ourselves. And I'm proud to say I keep working on myself to be better for me and for the ones around me. This is a very strong um, writing. Thank you so much, Gloria, for sharing this with us. And um, David and Rosam um, are saying that this is a beautiful and powerful and vulnerable self-portrait. Um, mental health is a really important issue and many are even more vulnerable, vulnerable during this time of the coronavirus. It is really brave and strong of Gloria Vier um, to share this intimate and personal part of her life. Um, the movement and her expression shows how deeply emotional this time is for her. The light and how she framed by, by tapestry hones in the focus on her and her strength. 
And the final image is submitted by uh, Giuliani Torres from Puerto Rico. Um, and the caption says the quote, mama, everybody should be here to tell the government to do, to do things right. Um, and this is, the, 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 re the review note is this picture reminds us that the coronavirus is not only the pressing, not the only issue, uh, pressing issue of our time, but it is always uh, uh, prevalent with the use of masks and social distancing. It connects us by showing the universal struggles in our life. And uh, the, visually, the repeating geometric patterns in this image draw you to the, to the mother and son during their teaching and learning moment. It's a simple image revealing a very human story um, found in a larger event. That's, um, these are the five images from last week. Awesome. Thank you for, for taking us through those, Evgenia. And I just, I mean, I also want to underscore um, those images were so powerful, uh, particularly the ones that um, portray, that were so vulnerable and, and portrayed kind of those most vulnerable times in all of our lives. And, you know, I, I do think it's worth remembering that so many people around the world right now are going through a lot. Um, with this global pandemic, with, with the kind of intersecting crises that were already happening. Um, and so I, I just, I, I just want to underscore for everyone that if you're feeling anxious or stressed or depressed, know that you're not alone um, and that those feelings are um, and that taking the time to work is a sign of maturity and strength um, rather than a sign of, of weakness. Um, I also just want to say thank you to Evgenia and Jorge for taking us through those beautiful presentations and also giving us a look behind the scenes um, on, on work that I think many of us have seen uh, uh, before now, but, but didn't quite know the, the process uh, that, that went into it. Um, so uh, it was been, it's been amazing to learn from, from you. Um, and finally, I just want to thank everyone uh, for tuning in. John, Marcus, thanks for coming on camera for us. Everyone in the uh, YouTube, watching live on YouTube or, or watching later on YouTube, thanks for joining us. Uh, remember that uh, if you do share anything about your experiences through PhotoCamp Live, use our hashtag PhotoCamp Live on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, and don't forget that if you want to submit uh, a, your assignment to be reviewed on next week's show, um, you can use the link that's in the description of this video. Um, you can follow me at A.E. Brennan on Twitter and Instagram and National Geographic at Inside Nat Geo on Instagram. Um, finally, I just want to make sure to remind everyone uh, that if you do decide to complete this week's assignment, uh, to please uh, follow all of the public health guidelines um, in the United States especially, but really all around the world, it's important that uh, we are all doing our parts to flatten the curve and to uh, keep our communities safe. So please uh, do whatever you can uh, to be safe. Um, thank you all again for joining us. If you're available next Tuesday, July 14th at 2 p.m., uh, you can join my friend Sahar for the latest installment of Gen Geo Careers in Conservation, where you'll hear from National Geographic explorer Gab Mejia, who's an international award-winning photographer, conservationist, mountaineer, and emerging storyteller. Uh, and of course, I will see all of you back here next week, uh, Friday, 2 p.m. sharp. Uh, for our uh, late next edition of PhotoCamp Live. But until then, ciao everyone. <laughs>